Aloha. <laughs> Mahala. Um, so Joshua, thanks very much for the kind introduction. Can everyone hear me who wants to? <laughs> How's this? No, no. Um, thank you all for also getting up uh, early and coming down and to hear what is pretty much bound to be a pretty gloomy presentation. You know, <laughs> I mean, what do you expect from a guy that writes books called The End of Oil and The End of Food? Um, and I got, and I got, as an aside, I have to tell you, my, my son, my own son, who's 12, tells me, you know, Dad, you might want to come up with a book title that induces people to buy the book. So, <laughs> <laughs> so his, his suggestion for my next book is, he wants, he's uplifting, optimistic, so his suggestion is um, The Beginning of Cake. <laughs> Thank you, Isaac. But you know, so, so the end of food, what was this about? Well, I mean, at the time that I was beginning this book, food prices hadn't begun their historic spike. And so it didn't appear to me that we were at the end of the food supply. It was more that we'd sort of run out of confidence in the system responsible for producing that food supply. You know, and, and you, know, you could not swing a cat without running into a news story about some new calamity in the food system. You know, pathogens of every kind on every, you know, on our spinach and our peanut butter, our ground beef, our tomatoes, or was it chilies? And we had, uh, you know, tainted imports from Mexico and China. And we had a billion people nearly worldwide that couldn't get enough to eat, and another billion who were getting too much to eat. And in between that, we had this agribusiness model that was, you know, busily using up all the water and destroying all the soil that we need to produce the food in the first place. So. You know, everyone in this room has kind of known about these things for decades. But what was striking in the last few years was that even mainstream consumers and producers were starting to feel a little anxious about the, what they were eating, what they were putting in their mouths. And what was even more striking was it looked as if we were getting some action, some changes in behavior. If you go back a year, like last summer with high food prices and high energy costs, we were seeing changes in behavior, the way people were, were sort of dealing with food. Um, high food costs, people were uh, cooking more. They were sort of de-industrializing their diets in order to drive down costs. And with higher energy costs, higher transportation costs, suddenly this sort of global supply chain model didn't seem very tenable. And you, you had food distribution companies saying, I can no longer afford to bring in food from the tip of South America all the way to Alaska. I'm going to have to rely more on regional suppliers. I might even have to rely on local suppliers. And all of a sudden, Regional and local suppliers appear to have this economic advantage. And you begin to see changes in the food system that you know, we've been sort of pushing for for decades with mixed success, and yet they're happening. They said they're happening automatically. We're not having to do anything. The revolution's sort of picking up by itself. And, and you know, given that we have been pushing at this for so long, it was a pretty welcome development. And then what happens? Sort of the bottom falls out. Prices come down, and a lot of the mainstream consumers and producers revert to the behavior that what they were doing before. So, 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 so what happened? Well, I mean, we can we can say, okay, well, prices will come back, and 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 you know, we can argue that the the revolution will continue as soon as prices come back up. But the truth is, and and everyone in this room knows this, that this revolution is not going to do itself. It's not going to operate by itself. The market is not going to fix this problem for us. I mean, the market is probably, if not the most, it's one of the most powerful forces on the planet. And, and we're not going to build the next food system without the market's help. But the market by itself is not going to do this. We're going to have to make this revolution happen the old-fashioned way. We're going to have to make it happen. And I think that's the lesson of this last uh, price cycle episode. For as tempting as it is to believe that the market can do this for us, I think what we're realizing is it can't. Now, how do we go about making the revolution happen? Well, we continue doing what we have been doing. We, we work on making our own value propositions better. We become better entrepreneurs. But at the same time, and more importantly, more fundamentally, we have to become better at articulating why we need a revolution in the first place. Why is it that we need an alternative revolution? You know, what is it about the alternative revolution that's going to be beneficial? More importantly, what is it about the status quo that isn't working? Because you have to, you have to keep in mind that for an awful lot of mainstream consumers and producers, the status quo is actually working. Yes, there are some problems with the system. There are some safety problems. There are some problems with the contamination. Maybe the agribusiness model is producing a lot of pesticides that are getting into the water. 
But for the most part, most consumers believe those are individual problems that can be solved individually. If you've got safety problems at food plants, just hire more inspectors. If you've got contaminated food coming in from China, you need tougher border controls. We need to do a better job of articulating why these problems are not separate, why they're not discrete, why you can't treat them singly. We need to do a better job of articulating, as a community, why these problems are actually symptoms of a deeper problem, which is essentially and a food system that's become so industrialized it's moving past the point of diminishing returns. In other words, we need to tell a better story here. We need to remind people that it's not simply a matter of hiring more inspectors. I mean, sure, we can take the CEO of the Peanut Corporation and, and put the guy in jail, but we're going to also have to address the larger system that allowed the food from that plant to move through our food economy so quickly that it was in people's houses and in their stomachs before regulators even knew there was a problem. That's going to take far more than passing tougher regulations or putting people in jail. So we're going to need a better, we're going to need a better story, a better narrative that, that, it, that, that explains where these problems came from. Too often when we in the alternative community talk about these problems, it's as if the problems were dropped on us from outer space or more likely from greedy corporations. The truth is, most of the problems we're dealing with today, they have a history. They began some time ago. They involve a complex interplay of factors and players. There's a story behind them. And, and, and most ironically, most of the problems we're dealing with began some time ago as what? As solutions. They began as someone's well-intended, but perhaps ill-considered, attempt to solve an earlier problem. That's the story we've got to get out there because until mainstream consumers and producers understand that, they will continue to focus on problems as single events. And they will not look at the entire system. So what I want to talk to you today about is coming up with a new story, a new way to frame this debate that takes in the comprehensiveness of the story, that looks at it from beginning to end, and helps people understand that the problem is far more complex than simply dealing with more inspectors or tougher border controls and that the solutions will have to reflect that complexity. And, and the way I've been doing it is drawing on my own experiences researching the food industry and interacting with food and coming up with ways, stories, that explain how things began. Things that began as solutions and turned into problems. And, and the hope is that when someone reads these things, they understand that you know, it's not a simple thing to fix this. Now, I'm not suggesting you take the examples I'm about to give you as your own, but I am hoping it might provoke you to reach into your own experience, your own perspective, your own dealings with your sector, and come up with new ways to frame problems that you've been dealing with for decades. Now, the one I'd like to start with today is a sort of a classic in the annals of food screw-ups. And it uh, begins in um, post-World War II, Hudson River, fishermen, they notice something bizarre about the fish. The fish are getting bigger every year. Now, most fishermen don't complain about big fish, but in this case, because these fish were being hooked downstream from a pharmaceutical laboratory, there was some concern that the effect was not entirely natural. 